I'm Scott Al Miller. It is a beautiful day here in Nicaragua, and I am out for a walk because I've had the busiest day. I've had no time to do the show, and I've got to get one out today. We're going to be talking about my kids' schooling because my kids go to school here in Nicaragua, or sort of, and I got some questions about what to do about adult children, children, kids, you're right, your kids, that are moving down with you to Nicaragua. How are they going to be looking at an income future uh, so when they move to a different country, presuming they're expats. All right, we're gonna get to that after the bump. I have had just the busiest day of phone calls and meetings and the sun is low, so it's really in my face. So I apologize, it's my only chance to record the show all day. So this week has been really crazy and coming up in two days, I have a wedding uh, that I'm videoing. So I'm gonna be super busy on Friday. Hopefully over the weekend, I'm gonna have a little bit of a chance to start catching up. So two topics, both of which are relatively quick, which is bold statement coming from me, I know. But uh, first topic, my kids, a lot of people wanna know what my kids do for school and how we do it. So my kids homeschool and they always have. Now, for those who don't know, my kids are 12 and 15 and we have planned around them homeschooling since the very beginning. We knew we were gonna live abroad, at least for a large portion of their life, when they were tiny, maybe in some ways before they were born. So we've always had a plan that homeschooling was our, our goal because uh, we knew that they were going to move around a lot. We wanted to make sure that they had uh, accessibility to the world and trying to put them from school to school, uh, especially in foreign countries, uh, would, would be very difficult. And many of the places that we've lived, including like Spain and, and Italy, had no English speaking schools available where we lived. So that would have caused even more problems, even though you'd say, well, Spain and Italy, those are really easy to get English language schools, sort of. But they're not, not if you live in small villages, not if you live out, you know, if you live in Rome, you live in, in Milan, you live in Madrid, oh, of course, crazy easy. But we didn't, we lived in tiny villages, and uh, which has been really good, really good for the family. It's a really good cultural experience. It's great for the kids. They really have an appreciation of places that they wouldn't get if they lived in big cities and went to English or multilingual schools. So there's been really good aspects of that, but there's there's limitations. So we have always planned on homeschooling. And since we did that from day one, it's been really good uh, for a lot of reasons. Both my wife and I have very strong education backgrounds, both uh, as uh, uh, a lot of education for ourselves. A lot of, you know, we have a lot of backgrounds, so we're able to handle a lot of subjects in different, different areas. Uh, but also we have worked in education, uh, both of us to some degree, much less than professional full-time educators, but we've both worked in the school system. Uh, I've done university work. Uh, I've done a lot of teaching in the industry. So we have a lot of pedagogical experience um, compared to just average people uh, and that, really gives us a leg up when doing homeschool. It's, it's, uh, we're in a lot better position to help out with a lot of things for school. There's really no subject through really pretty much a four-year degree that we can't teach at home. So a lot of flexibility there, that certainly helps. Uh, so as far as what programs, because everybody wants to know what we use for programs for that. And uh, honestly, we've used a lot over the years. And at times we bounce around from one to another. So we've used quite a few and we're constantly changing. I believe currently the one they're on is called Excellus. I've been mostly happy with it, not thrilled. We always mix and match some things. Sometimes we get them local classes. Sometimes we get one or two classes through a different program. We let them choose. I mean, they're at a point where they're very good at motivating themselves. They're very good at picking what they want to do. They're very good at making plans and schedules. And certainly they're, you know, they're kids and they still, there's a lot that they, they're still learning and, you know, disciplining themselves to work on things early or whatever. They still have to do that stuff, right? They're, they're learning, they're improving. But they're very good at taking time and making decisions about their own education and saying, well, here's something I'm interested in learning. Here's something I'm not interested in learning. And they're, you know, I think when you send kids to public school, a lot of the time their goals are just, I want to get out of it because it's really all just busy work. They don't see a value. They don't see an enjoyment. They don't see an end goal. And often there isn't one, right? I've talked to public educators and often they say, no, our, we're babysitting. There's no, there's no educational goal here. We're not here to educate your kids. That's the parent's job. Maybe it's the university's job. It's not our job. It's not our mandate. It's not what we're tooled up to do. It's not what we're told to do. None of that. So if you think you're sending kids to public school to get education, 
<laughs> whoa, you're in for a surprise, right? And that, that's them telling us. I, I assume my audience already knows that. So, so when you empower kids, for, especially from the beginning, so they have this context, that school is for learning, that you only spend the amount of time in it that you need to to learn things, so you get to move along at your own pace, uh, that you uh, can focus your school on what matters to you to some degree, right? The kids are still like, why do I have to learn this thing? Well, I know you don't understand why you need it, but you're going to use this. But other things that they, they will argue, right? This is a thing that I don't need. Oh, well, no, you probably don't. Okay, well, what do you need that you haven't been taught? Let's let's get to that, right? And so they, they will uh, make those changes. They'll make those decisions. They'll have those conversations. And and my youngest, uh, she one of the things they're supposed to take, because we're Texans, is they're supposed to take uh, citizenship. They're supposed to learn how to work with the system. And one of the classes that she had is biology. And the biology class, one, does some offensive things. So that's separate. Uh, but they also try to force dissection. Well, under Texas law, you can't require someone to do dissection. As soon as they offer dissection, all students have the fundamental right to opt out, period, end of story. So it was a really great experiment in she looked up and researched and, and learned her rights as a Texas citizen as a student and used them and said, this is not a thing I'm going to do. This school is teaching something that I find offensive and immoral. I don't have to do it and completely got a far better, you know, she will never use dissection of a frog or whatever in her life. Like that is the most useless thing to a person who's not going into biology or veterinary care. Medical, you know, there's, there's fields that need it, not one she'll consider. And, and instead she got this really great education on how to use the law and to be a good citizen and to use the system for what it's intended for to protect students from traumatizing experiences that have no purpose. All right, so it was really, really good and a great example of where having a homeschool has given her uh, the knowledge and the power to go out and do the things that are good and not just sit and take it, which is so often what happens in public school or, or just wasting time or sitting out and doing nothing. Instead, she can focus on learning something. And, and they do when they're not in school, right? If they're not doing official classwork stuff, nearly every moment of their lives is something doing really constructive. And that's something that we really appreciate. And not everybody's kids are going to do that, but an awful lot will. It's amazing how much people actually want to be productive if simply given the power to do so. If you block people all the time, adults, children, doesn't matter, then they're going to push back and try not to do things or whatever. But when you empower them and give them the freedom to do what is good for them, suddenly my kids are doing art projects and creative projects and educational things and exploring things and literary things and all kinds of really valuable experiences, far better than they get for the most part in their schooling, and it's completely self-taught, completely self-motivated, completely on their own. The school doesn't need to do that. And all we have to do is make sure that we minimize the amount of time the school takes so it doesn't get in the way of all the things they want to learn. It's been fantastic, I gotta say. So, I mean, it's, it's more complex than just, you know, set kids loose and let them do whatever. Ours are older, so they've worked through a lot of the complexities, a lot of the how do you motivate them? How do you get them started? That is definitely more challenging when they're super young, but it was not that bad, right? Now, of course, my wife did a lot of that, so it was not that bad for me, I suppose. But, and, and my kids have said many times how valuable they found the whole experience from a, they, you know, because like, their cousins go to public school and they're like, oh, we spend so much less time in school and we learn so much more stuff and we have so much more free time and so much more flexible time. So when we, we want to do something as a family, right? When they talk to their cousins, it's always, well, the school has this thing scheduled at this time, or we got to get up at this time. And all, we have time to do that thing, but it's too complicated because of some schedule that isn't ours that we have no real reason to have, except that's just when the school decides to do stuff. And so, and, and of course, adults have that too, right? So uh, for us, we've worked really hard as adults to not have really hard schedules. He says on a day when he's so busy, he wasn't able to film. Uh, but, and so we extend that to our kids. We've worked really hard to make sure our kids have flexible schedules so that we as a family have, since the time they were born, basically always had really flexible schedules and we could go do things as a family or things as different family units all the time, whenever it makes sense. If I get free time and my kids get free time and it's two o'clock in the morning and we all feel like it, we're gonna play a video game and hang out. And when my kids play video games, 
This is not necessarily because of homeschooling, but it certainly helps. They have deep literary discussions about those video games. We have a video game literary analysis channel on YouTube where we talk about the, the stuff going on in video games and, and storytelling and, and interactive fiction and how, uh, you know, video gaming can be a much more, very much more serious literary format than say books, which are passive and you can't interact and you can't engage, right? We live in a generation where the literary of the past, the literary criticism and the literary interaction of the past is seen as very lazy, very phoning it in. Like sure, you know, Mark Twain wrote some amazing books, but could he have handled writing them in an interactive way? Could he have made it more engaging? Could he have made it way more prescient to the people who are using it? Maybe he could have. He probably would have made some amazing video games. He was a brilliant writer and that would probably translate. But how much do people engage with his work compared to some works that are available today? Like it's, they really, you know, it's important. It's often, you know, often the case of older generations will be like, you know what matters? Typewriters and cursive and reading paper books. Why? Sure, those are the things that we were taught were important because our teachers were phoning it in, right? They weren't bothering to think. They weren't engaging their brains. They weren't saying, are these things gonna be useful when these kids are older? I've never had to use a typewriter as an adult. I've never had to use cursive as an adult. I don't read novels as an adult. I read an awful lot of novels when I was young. I do appreciate because I didn't have a lot of great video games back then. But now I don't want to waste my time on some phoned it in media. I want something more serious. I want something where they cared more. And of course, Louisa May Alcott, when she wrote Little Women, didn't have access to write video games. So for the time period, she's got some great stuff. But today, I, there's a reason why the great novels aren't coming out anymore, because they're video games most of the time today. Novels are great when you're driving in the car and you want to listen to something in the background and you don't want to be overly engaged. Novels are for the passive experience. They're, for, they're the equivalent of television. All the things that people said about televisions and movies when we were kids in like the 70s and 80s and 90s. Oh, well, you know, you really should read a book because, you know, TV and, and movies, it's just, it just does all the work for you. Well, guess what? If you really step back and look at it, books are part of that. They're all together essentially equal in being the super don't do anything. I mean, let's face it, you can fall asleep reading a book pretty easily. You can totally forget that you're doing it. The whole thing is just so light as an experience. It's so non-engaging. And when it is engaging, well, it can be, so can TV and, and movies. You can't get one to be engaging without the others also being engaging. You can't make one light without the others being light. All the criticism that they had about television actually applies equally to books. We just ignored it because everyone was told we had to. Don't think critically, don't analyze, don't engage your brains. And what is the tool? What is the, the prize of people who don't want you to engage your brains? Books and other passive media. The thing about books is you're forced to accept everything that they say. You can disagree, but you have to disagree silently. To whom will you disagree? In a video game, sometimes at least, you have the ability to participate and refuse to do things that they want you to do or participate but make choices. It depends, but there's an opportunity at least in a way that traditional passive literature did not. So these are things that my kids get really into, right? They do more serious literature every day than any college professor I ever had up until the modern era, right? It just, it's a different level. And so enabling that and partly living in Nicaragua and living around the world, traveling a lot, will give you scope, will give you uh, an empowerment to be like, you know what? Just because someone tells you something, you don't have to listen to that, right? You get told that this is the way the world is and you move somewhere else and you find out that there's a whole world of people who not only don't believe the same thing you believe, but they don't even know about it and their system still works and maybe it works better. Not always, sometimes it works worse, worse. But, but suddenly it's like, oh, the world isn't as black and white. The world isn't so, you know, one way is best and everything else doesn't even work suddenly you realize there's, there's just so much more and you can challenge the systems and you can you know, broaden your minds and you can choose what direction to learn and you can go harder. You don't have to be held back because everyone else, this is all they do, right? You, can, you get to go so much further, so much harder, so much more in depth if that's what matters to you. And, uh, and when it's something really wasteful, 
cursive. Okay, now I know what cursive is. I know I will never use it. Let's move on. Let's not waste brain resources on this when I could be learning something that would actually help me throughout my life. So that the whole homeschooling experience has been wonderful. Um, I think every student pretty much needs a custom path. So I could tell you what we use and I'm happy to when I know, uh, but they use so many different resources and have used so many over the years and so often we customize we'll be like okay you're gonna do this class we're gonna skip this part of it or do this thing or add this thing on or whatever and they do a ton of stuff on their own that you know you really need part of the whole homeschool experience is not finding what's best it's finding the customization for your specific children uh, so i highly recommend homeschool in most situations especially for people who are looking to move abroad it will give your kids so many more opportunities so much flexibility um and 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 it's so much more time to be together as a family so much time for them to actually get to appreciate and experience being in another country being in another place <laughs> that was my wife driving by and uh, that's really funny that's them And so homeschooling has been great. We've been really happy with it. The kids have been really happy with it. I know very few, not zero, but I know very few people who've done homeschooling and wanted to leave it. Sometimes people have said, especially when they're like homeschooling, but they live in say Dallas, where we're from, uh, We've known some, some homeschoolers who are like, ah, oh, but all the people we know around us, they all go to school together. And even if I don't like the, the educational mechanism of the public school or the private school, whatever it is, uh, I wanna be around the other kids and have this shared experience because I plan on growing up in Texas. I, I plan on being a part of this community. And some places, especially Texas, are very strong in the, everyone does the same thing. Everyone goes to the same universities. Everyone goes to the same high schools. Everybody has a shared experience. Conformity, conformity, conformity. And if your goal is conformity, or your culture is one of conformity, then public schools tend to be very good for that. And if you want to give your kids the option of not conforming or conforming only when it makes sense for them, when they agree with it, when they want to, then homeschooling gives them a lot more power to make those decisions. And of course, my wife and I grew up in New York where conformity is a bad word, right? You say, ah, oh, you know, this, this school thing's all about conformity everybody would be like defensive of it. Oh, no, no, it's not about conformity. It's about a standardized education. It's about meeting a baseline, whatever. But you say the same thing in Texas. Oh, school's all about conformity. And immediately it sounds like a good thing. Oh yeah, the last thing we want is kids that don't conform. We don't want people standing out doing different things. Very different mindset really quickly. And uh, so just, just what is seen as positive and what is seen as negative changes. But that is, so a lot of it comes down to what you want or what your kids want. Do they want to feel like everyone else? Do they want to make sure they don't stand out and they have the exact same experiences of everyone else? And that's valuable. I went to a private school when I was a kid and I could sense that I was getting a very different experience than everyone else. And moving to public school was very different and it was much more valuable both because I got a better education and I got to have a more conforming experience, which was nice. I was able to, you know, have a shared experience with a lot of people that I hadn't had for my first uh, nine years of school. So, you know, it's, it's, there's value both ways, but of all the options, I think that, uh, you know, especially now there's so much socialization online. The idea that you go to school for socialization is crazy. Um, that's, it does anything but. It takes time away from socialization. It teaches bad socialization. It teaches prison socialization. It punishes you for socializing, but makes socialization the only value that they promote. It's a very strange system. That is never why someone goes to school. Yes, conformity, and you want to be just like everyone else. You want to feel like part of the group. Public school is going to do a lot to help that. If you plan to stay in a place where everyone's going to have that shared experience. But if you, you plan on living around the world or having a broader experience, or your kids are going to, then that conformity can actually work against them. Once you get to a broader scope, you may find that what that sense of conformity actually ends up in a, in a sense of isolation because they may be the only ones who conformed or the only ones who conformed in that way. Just like I went to school in New York. When I moved to Texas, we really stood out as being anything but conformed, right? Because we had a very different educational experience and our knowledge of just things were very skewed from Texas knowledge of things. So what was deemed conformity-ish in New York actually resulted in non-conformity when we moved to Texas. And that's all within one country. Imagine if you're moving abroad and going to many different countries, 
that can be really weird. And when I worked on Wall Street, one of the things that I noticed on Wall Street is all the people, basically everyone, who was high, highly paid, really respected in very senior positions, none of them went through highly conforming educational paths. It's a very anecdotal thing, but it was tens of thousands of people that I worked with, and you would never meet people who just did the norm. Everybody had a unique story, tons of them were homeschooled, and many of them went to, to school in many different countries so that they're, even if they were conforming locally, their experiences were totally different from each other. All right, our second question was, you know, I'm moving down to Nicaragua soon with, I, I think, three, maybe four adult children. They're like 20-ish, I think. Not 20 years old, not 20 of them. And <laughs> that, wow. Um, and uh, uh, the person who's moving down is, is basically at retirement. So, so he's all set. But what are his kids going to do? Obviously, they, he'll help them out initially. But you know, they need to have careers and stuff on their own. So what do they do in Nicaragua to make money? So everyone has this kind of question, maybe not exactly this, this is a little bit unique, but, but this kind of question comes up a ton. How am I gonna earn money in Nicaragua? So the, the super easy answer is you're not. That's not gonna happen. That is out of the question to such a degree. Just no, not gonna happen. Well, okay, Scott, that's definitive. But what do they do? Well, okay, so the question shouldn't be, how are they gonna make money in Nicaragua? It shouldn't be that specific. And really, you don't ever wanna be that specific, uh, but it's tempting, right? But what is the actual goal? Well, the goal is not to make money in Nicaragua. The goal is to live in Nicaragua. Okay, good, we got one goal. And then they're gonna need money. Like we want them to have the ability to pay for things. So they have a, another goal of earning money. Great. So they want to live in Nicaragua and they want to earn money. Those things together do not imply, they should not lead us to the assumption, they shouldn't rule it out either, but they shouldn't lead us to the assumption that they're going to make their money in Nicaragua. That is the leap that we have to get everyone to stop making, right? Everybody makes that leap and you can kind of see why, but it's super important that that is not a leap we make because it is, uh, it is a not illogical conclusion, but it is a series of constraints that do not actually exist and end up at a result that feels relatively logical, but essentially is impossible. So we really don't want to end up there. And this is a good example here in Nicaragua, something you need to watch out for specifically, but in life in general, when you're making decisions, it's in, it, people tend to make these kinds of leaps all the time. I want to live someplace and I want to make money and they'll just combine them into, well, and I need to make money there. Right, and that's, that's just not good reasoning. And we see similar things in all the people who are asking questions about like, well, I have to get residency or I have to get citizenship because I have to buy a house and I have to, and you'll, you'll start asking and you're like, so wait, 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 why do you want residency? And they'll say, well, I have to buy a house. I'm like, well, why do you have to buy a house? Well, because I don't want to like, whatever, I, I need to be able to stay. And you're like, you know that Getting a house doesn't help you get residency and getting residency doesn't help you get a house like none of these things are connected And I have this conversation like two or three times a week and every time people are like wait Buying a house doesn't help with your residency. I'm like not at all Well, but don't and then the other half of people but don't I have to be a resident to buy a house Like you could buy a house today if you have the money just buy it. You've never been here. Just buy a house doesn't matter And they're like what wait Every assumption is wrong, right? Because they're all just assumptions and very wild ones, I think. I don't know any place where you need to be a resident to buy a house. Like that's not, that's not normal anywhere. So, all right, so anyway, let's actually get back to the question. So what do you do? So assuming you're from, well, we're gonna assume like the United States or Canada, someplace that has income. If you're coming from someplace where there's no job opportunities, no career opportunities whatsoever, then you're an asylum seeker and you're, you, you have your own challenges and I'm really sorry for you, but I can't give you really strong advice. Maybe if I knew exactly where you're from, and what you could do, like maybe I could help, but I can't in some general sense be like, uh, all asylum seekers uh, or refugees should do this. Like, it's just not that easy, but certainly I would like to help. Uh, but for those of you who are coming from, you know, first world, large economy countries where you have the right to work and you're gonna live in Nicaragua, you've got the golden ticket, right? Willy Wonka has come to your house personally and given you the chocolate bar and winked a few times, right? Eat the chocolate, enjoy your, your golden ticket and go take over the factory. You have the opportunity to do one of two things. Either one, you're going to look for a work from home or work remote, whatever, 
consulting gig for, or, or group of, of project gigs from the United States or Canada or wherever. That's the first thing. You can just go take a job like you would if you lived in the US and just make sure it's a remote one. And I realize that for some careers, that's super hard. You wanna be a plumber and do it remote? Super hard. Yeah, you're gonna to have to do a different job than your favorite one. Sorry, it's not perfect, but it does give you opportunities. You could, you know, work in a call center. You could work doing translations. You could work doing who knows what. I don't know what skills you have. I don't know what jobs are out there today, but they're out there. Go take a job. And yeah, you'll probably earn less than you would make in the US, but you'll earn way more than you could ever possibly make if you worked in Nicaragua doing the same thing, if you were allowed to, which you're not. But if you were allowed to, you wouldn't want to because you would get paid so little because there's other people waiting to do that job at a fraction of what you'd want to take because you have access to a market that will pay more. So. It's, it's, this isn't about you being shut out of something that you want to do. If you had any idea what the jobs are like here, you would never ask for one. Like, it's just, it's sad, right? It's horrible that that's the situation. I would love that that be corrected, but that is the reality. If you can work outside Nicaragua, you are not going to work inside Nicaragua. But if you can live inside Nicaragua, you're not gonna live outside Nicaragua. Wink, wink, know what I mean? It's the best, right? This is amazing to live in. You just can't be employed here. So embrace the fact that you have the golden ticket and leverage it. Now, if you don't wanna work for someone else or you for some reason can't, that's okay. There are other paths. And that main other path is starting a company in the US or Canada or wherever. There's nothing stopping you as a citizen of whatever country you're coming from, from going out and starting your own business. It doesn't have to be a wildly successful business. It doesn't have to be a grandiose business. It doesn't have to be huge. You can just go out and start a business and find ways to make money without having to be someone's employee. Now that's obviously a lot harder. Most people just wanna be an employee and make their money, especially if you like live in Nicaragua, you just want to make some money and live it up in paradise and not have to worry about the stress of finding customers or keeping the, the company running or paying the taxes or whatever. Totally get it. But it's an option and a good one and a lot of people do it. Use the opportunity to start a business that makes sense for you to work remotely. And it could be that you're simply managing a team remotely. Well, you have enough money that you're going to start a, I don't know, a t-shirt factory in, in Oklahoma City. You're gonna hire two people, three people, and they're gonna do sales, marketing, printing, shipping. They're gonna start selling stuff. Maybe you'll do some work from here. Maybe you'll work on the books. Maybe you'll make the website. Maybe you'll, you'll do some of the fulfillment uh, digitally. Lots of options. You can do a lot of things to potentially make money and, and you don't have to work for someone else. But I think people really tend to miss both. Just go out and find a job. This is not, you know, how would you, what would you do if you were in the US and just needed to work from home? I would just go find a job, right? That's all you got to do. It's that simple. And what if you don't want to work for someone else? What would you do? Or what if you couldn't work for someone else? I guess I could just start my own business. Exactly. By moving to Nicaragua, you are in no way losing either of those opportunities. Those are both still there for you, just like they are if you lived back in your home country. Now, yes, you may be at a disadvantage because you can't personally pop into a customer site. You can't personally put a box into the mail and send it off to someone to fulfill a shipment. You've got to have employees to do those things, or you've got to have a service that does those things, something. So sure, there's some additional challenges, but there's also huge advantages. I'm trying to get some decent light out here during a really, I mean, it's beautiful. Let's, let's actually show you what I'm seeing. It is a beautiful walk out here. There's a lot of wind though, so I apologize for the, the wind sounds, they kind of unavoidable. So yes, you're at this major disadvantage that you can't do a bunch of work physically in person, and, and that's unfortunate. However, as someone who has started companies in the United States, one of the hardest things is, as you start a company, trying to pay yourself to be able to live can be hard. You start up that business, you make no money in the first month, and maybe at some point you're making $1,000 a month, but that's it. If you're living in Oklahoma City, you can't live on $1,000 a month. Cannot be done, period. You will starve while living in the street. That's it. And you're not gonna be able to go out and get customers because no one wants to talk to the homeless guy who's starving to death. They're gonna be like, dude, get to a hospital, maybe take a job. But if you're in Nicaragua and you're bringing in that thousand dollars a month, suddenly you're doing fine. You're not living like a king, but you're eating just fine, perfectly healthy. You've put a roof over your head, no problem. 
You may have bought a car. You definitely have internet access and a computer. You are living actually pretty comfortably, even though you're only making $1,000 a month. And so in the US, you would need $4,000 a month just to be like, okay, my company is now looking like maybe it could do something. But if that same $4,000 was coming in and you were living in Nicaragua, you'd be like, I'm, I may not even need to grow anymore. This is doing so much, I'm, I'm good, right? Like I'm able to do anything I wanna do. I got loads of money, I feel great. If I did more, I'd have to work harder. I don't need to, right? So that flexibility might be far greater than you realize. And by living in Nicaragua, you may make yourself able to start a small business and survive or get past the startup phase or not have to bring on other investors and own it all yourself all because you didn't have the huge living expenses that you would have in the US. And then imagine doing it in New York or LA or something like that. Oh, you need 10,000 a month just to keep the roof over your head. Holy cow, how do you build a business up to that point? You can, but it's hard when you don't have any saved up money. But if you're here in Nicaragua without saved up money, you may really quickly be able to get to a point where you can run a business. So those are the ways, you know, get a job, but in your home country, or start a business again in your home country and use that as your funding source to bring money in so that you can live here in Nicaragua. And this is also important. I hope this wind has not gotten too bad because it's really windy. If I was on the other camera, this would be worthless footage. If you start bringing in those kinds of numbers, even like $2,000 a month, and not even that much, from a business that you own in the US, you are suddenly in the category, now age-wise in this case, we're too young, but you can start making, we're gonna wait for the wind. From an age perspective, you may be on the early side, but there are programs for people who are, if you're making that kind of money, not even $2,000 a month, but if you're making $2,000 a month, you're probably golden. You are going to qualify for residency one way or another here in Nicaragua. If you are attempting to work here, you would be basically, even if you were, so again, you're not allowed to work here, but if they somehow gave you a loophole and let you, you would be struggling to earn enough to qualify for residency to be able to stay here to keep doing the job. But if you're working remotely, whether just working for someone or you have your own business that's bringing in that money, they don't care and they don't classify it. They don't even look into it. However that money's coming to you, you're gonna qualify for residency barring, barring any weird situation that would, that would keep you from getting residency. And you'll be able to stay here indefinitely because of the way that you're working. So that's really important that these are mechanisms you really want to look into because by bringing that money in, you're, you're super valuable to the country. So it's not just that you're going to get residency for you. It's also going to mean that you're doing this really good thing for the country. So you're being a really big benefit. Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you've got any more questions, which I really, really appreciate, please get down there in the comments and let me know what you think of this episode, other episodes, what you want to talk about, what you want to hear. Just hit me up down there. We appreciate all the conversation. As always, if you could like and subscribe, tell your friends about the show, post on social media, and I will see all of you tomorrow.